Welcome to West Cop Church. You guys stand on your feet. We're going to start out this morning speaking the name of Jesus, if that's okay with you guys. Um, he's here in this room as we approach him in worship. Let's just sing this out. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus.
church, if there's someone in this room today who's forgotten the power and the might in the name of Jesus, right now let's take that power back in this place. He's willing to break any chain. He's willing to heal any pain. Our God is the God who restores. Let's sing this in faith today. Come on. that y'all are here with us this morning to shout the name of Jesus. He's so good and worthy to be praised in this house. And we are so, so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Um, you know, I don't have a whole lot to tell you today. <laughs> really just, if you're a guest with us, thank you so much for being here. We'd love to remind you about our connect table um, that's outside in our lobby. So please, after service, feel free, go out there. We'd love to get to meet you. We've got a little gift for you. And we just love to say hey and welcome you to West Cobb Church. But we're going to keep worshiping. So I hope y'all are ready. <laughs>
Amen. Well, you guys can be seated. Awesome time of worship. So why the Toby Keith video? Um, on February 5th of this year, <clears throat> Toby Keith, the country music legend, died of stomach cancer. And he was 62 years of age, and just before his death, on the People's Choice Awards, he sang that song, Don't Let the Old Man In. And Don't Let the Old Man In was a song that was viral because of that moment, because Toby Keith was at the end of his life, and it was evident. You could see the physical toil of cancer treatment, and his days were numbered. And the song that he sang and wrote talks about the value of youth and the struggles of getting old. He's saying, fight, fight getting old. Don't let the old man in. And the key hook or the phrase in that song is this, if you caught it. Many moons I have lived, my body's weathered and worn. Ask yourself how you would be if you didn't know the day that you were born. The heart of the matter in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, as we conclude today the series Empty Seats, the heart of the matter is that youth is fleeting, God's purpose is priority, don't waste the life that he has granted to you. Because you will get old. There are days coming when you will be physically constrained, you will be mentally slower, and your body will feel the burden of age, like it or not. And Ecclesiastes 12 is actually a message to youth. It's to the young. So if you're in this room today, and I'll give you, if you're less than 40, well, then I, well, 50, since I'm in the 50s now. If you're less than 50, then you're young, right? And, uh, but he's giving some parting words as he closes out the book of Ecclesiastes to the young. And in fact, he opens up and he says in the beginning, he says, I wanna contrast the power of youth with the perils of aging. The power of youth with the perils of aging. In verse one, the writer says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come and the years of reproach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after rain. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. When the grinders cease because they are few. And those looking through the windows grow dim. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. When people rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs grow faint. When people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond trees blossom and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred, then people go to their eternal home and mourners go to the streets. What he's saying is this. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why? Because it's the opportunity to move into God's plan for your life and to be active in fulfilling God's purpose for most of your days. You see, there are many in this room that we'll call mature in age. And those of us that are mature in this room, mature in age, can honestly say that there are perhaps some regrets in our lives. Are there any of you here today that would be honest and say, when I look back on my life, I have regrets. There are things that I wish perhaps I would have known when I was young. 
You hear sayings, you hear people speak about the fact, if I only knew that when I was younger. So if you are here today, below 40, please listen to what I have to say, because I'm going to give to you the secret of life. I'm going to give to you that which matters most. I'm going to lay out for you how you can know the most that life has to offer today. He starts out and he says, listen to me because now is the time. The time is now when you are young because the processing of age, well, I'm not gonna say what I was gonna say. The (laughs) processing of age, it ain't fun, right? As you get older, he says those days are troubled. Well, I'll just say they stink, right? (laughs) They're troubled, why? Because as you age, you see your body break down. But as you age, you experience perhaps disappointments in life, expectations in life, regrets in life, and you get a little bitter in your life often as you age, right? There's trouble that comes your way because what you expected life to be and the actual outcome are completely different. He's saying, so listen to me if you're young because you need to take advantage of this moment now. Now is your time to move into the very purpose that God has for your life. Don't wait. Don't waste days. You can go talk to everyone that is older than me in this room today, and they will share with you, take advantage of the time that you have to live out God's purpose now. Don't waste it. Why? Because your body is going to fail. You know, it talks about in that passage of Scripture, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. Well, it's saying you're losing, your body's beginning to fail because you're going to lose eyesight, right? You're going to begin to lose eyesight. You're going to not be able to see clearly. Like, I take these off, not so clear anymore, right? I used to brag about having 2015 vision. Well, 40 came and I lost it. I don't know why. I lost it. He goes on and he says, this, is, this one I read, and the clouds return after the rain. There was one commentary I read that says it's hard to control your bladder is what that means. <laughs> don't know if that's true or not. But all I know is I drank a gallon of tea last night and I got up three times, right? So it is true, right? And so it goes on and it says, it talks about that the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. You start to lose strength, right? Your body begins to fail. Things are a little bit dimmer, right? You're not as strong as you once were. And it goes on and it describes how when you are what? When the grinders cease, they are few because they are few. What do you think he's talking about? When the grinders cease because they are few. You can talk to me here. It's very fun. You're losing your teeth, right? You're losing your teeth, right? And so now you're you're gumming on things, right? So it happens. This getting old, it is not fun. Stability. So this is a very, very bad description. So I'm telling you, take advantage while you are young because it will happen. It will happen. Hearing, eyesight, stability, the physical, the mobility, you began to lose it. And then he goes on and he says, there's desire and there's apathy. He said, you're gonna begin to lose desires. Desires are no longer stirred with you in the same way that you once were. A loss of wonder, been there, done that type of attitude starts to invade your life. And then he goes on and he says, you begin not only to lose your passions, but you begin to lose your purpose. He says, there's a difference between being zealous, I have zeal, and I'm indifferent. He talks about the fact that they will go to their eternal home and mourners will go about the streets. He's saying, when you get old, all you do is watch all your friends die. All the people around you die. I did a funeral this past week, a woman, 99 years of age. She had no friends there at her funeral because she outlived them all. She, 99 years of age. And now, 
She's the glory. But mourners on the streets, we watch our friends pass. We see each other getting old. It's not fun. We've all experienced it. You know, I was talking, I was like, how can I illustrate this? You know, I remember softball this past Monday night is a perfect illustration for me. Right, there was a day when a little bitty ground ball, right, that could just go right beside me where I could just very, 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 control, in a controlled fashion, very smooth, just pick it up and just toss it. And they hit a little ground ball by a girl, by the way, that was playing, right? Not that that's, not that that's a thing. I don't mean it that way, right? So, but she hit a little ground ball right there. And so I go and I, I stumble and I fumble and I can't even get the ball to first base because my body just doesn't move anymore. It doesn't work the same way that it did years ago. And what he's saying is, look, the decay that happens to you physically while funny, while funny, well, maybe not funny, but that decay happens spiritually and emotionally. How many of you are here today, you have lost, as you've aged, you've lost your zeal for God. You are indifferent to the things of God. How many of you are here today that you would say you've lost your purpose? How many of you would say, I don't think I have a purpose any longer? You see, what happens over time is that if we do not step into the purpose and plan that God has for our life, we can become indifferent to actually what God desires to do for each of us. And we don't want that. If you're young here today, I don't want you to be indifferent toward God. I want you to step into the journey that God has for your life because there's no greater blessing than knowing the purpose that God has for you. There's no greater riches that you can obtain than knowing the plans that God has specifically for your life. But too often, we learn that lesson late. And I'm telling you, learn it now. Pursue with all your being the plan that God has, the purpose that God has for you. And take advantage of those that are around you that have lived life and know this and understand this and have experienced this. Wisdom gained by the young will be found through the voice of the aged. Listen to me here. We know that God has a purpose and plan for everyone in this room. And those of us that have lived life and we've experienced life and all of those things that we laughed about earlier, we've experienced spiritually, emotionally, all of those struggles that we've gone through, they're not to be wasted they are purposeful in your life because you're to take that and you're to transfer it to those that are young so that they can get a head start in this life that God has planned out for them. We have a responsibility. Those of us who have gone through aging, those of us who have experienced life, we have a responsibility to pour, not to be indifferent, not to be bored with life, not to live without purpose, but to pour in to the young to pour into their lives so that they can experience the fullness of God for many more years than we actually have. Number two, a moment seized versus a moment wasted. I want you to read with me in verses six through eight. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well. And the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. What he's saying is this. Life is short, and we talked about that. We talked about that last week. Life is short, seize the moment, Moments don't last forever. It says that you will, as you were born, you will one day return to the ground and you will be dust. There is 
there is a promise for all of us in this room is that our life will come to an end. We don't know when that will be, but what Solomon conveys here is the image that all of us will experience death and our life will end. There is an end date for every single individual in this room. And the moment is now for us to capture what God has in store for each of our lives. Our time on earth is limited and it is not to be wasted, it is to be seized. Moments matter, moments are fleeting, and are you seizing them or are you wasting them? Now, recently I read a story and it showed a picture of a family in Northern Ireland. It was a father who had his son on his shoulders in 1998 and they were in Northern Ireland together. Next to them in the picture was a red, small red sports car. In one moment, that picture was taken. In the next moment, there was an explosion and a terrorist attack. In the next moment, there were 20 plus people killed and over 200 people injured. And the reality of it was, in one moment, literally seconds before the blast, you have a father and a son standing next to that car enjoying this moment to suddenly see it removed in one evil moment of time. And that picture represents to us that we are not guaranteed even the next moment of our existence, yet we take for granted that it is going to be there, and it may not. It can happen in a flash. And when we look at the life that we are living, the choice that we have is all of us can either seize the moments that are given to us or we can allow those moments to be wasted. Every little moment matters. Every little conversation matters. Every little walk down the street with the one that you love, it matters. And are you wasting those moments? The moments that matter are those you are granted. You've been granted these moments. They matter. Are you treating them with indifference? Are you allowing them just to go by? Are you wasting your mind, wasting your talent, wasting your resources, wasting the giftedness that God has given to you? Are you impactful in the lives of other people? Are you fruitful in your labor? Are you fruitful and intentional with your family? Or do you allow those moments just to go to waste because you sit in front of the TV or everybody's got their head stuck in the phone and you're not, you're not having any conversation, you're not having any influence, you're not digging into life together, you're not challenging each other, you're just going through the motions, existing in this life. I don't want that to be said of me. I don't want that to be my life. I don't want my existence to be wasted. I don't want your existence to be wasted. We have an opportunity to seize every single moment that we have been granted. Embrace those moments. It's not cliche. It's not cliche. It's the way that we should live our lives. When you sit with the one you love and you look into their eyes, be in the moment. Be in the moment. When you cheer for your child at a game, be in the moment. <laughs> be in that moment. When you talk to your mom on the phone, be in that moment. When opportunity arises, we have to seize it. Why? Because in an instant, life as you know it can change. It can change. I want you to think about this past week. Seriously, think about this past week. And I want you to think about the moments that mattered the most to you. 
I want you to think about the conversations that mattered most to you. I want you to think about what you remember. Do you remember a whole lot about work? Probably not. Most of us in this room, we're just glad Friday came, right? And we dread tomorrow. Preacher, you can preach as long as you want today because I don't want to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> nah. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you remember? You know, like for me, this past week, like I remember going to dinner with friends on Thursday night and having time where we just talk and laugh and have conversation. I remember being able to, what I remember is walking the dog with Beverly this week and having a long walk, picking up some poop on the way, and long conversations, right? Long conversations. Thinking about life, talking about life, dreaming about life, talking about what God is doing. Those are the things that you remember, is it not? Seize those moments. Take advantage of those moments. Don't let them be wasted. Number three, the heart of the matter versus the appeal of the flesh. Here we are. This right here, I mean, I know we went through all 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes, but we really could have went to these verses and summed the whole book up. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and he searched, and he set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings, like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Now, all has been heard here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. When he opens up in verse 9, here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, I've gone on this journey, and we know he has, right? If you think about the writer, Solomon, as many of us believe that that's who wrote it. When you think about Solomon, what do we know about Solomon? We know that he was a wealthy man. We know that he had access to anything and everything that he desired. We know that he had the financial capabilities, he had the power and he had the authority to actually go do whatever it is he wanted to do. And so he said, I'm on this journey to find purpose in life. And in this journey, he said, I'm going to go about finding purpose through what the world has to offer. Is that not what he said? And so he tried to find that purpose in multiple ways. He tried to find that purpose in fame. He tried to find that purpose in his own intelligence. He tried to find that purpose in big buildings, things that he could build. He tried to find that purpose in wine, women, and song. He tried to find that purpose in everything that life had to offer. And he came to a conclusion, I'm empty. I'm empty. I'm empty. Why? Because in his worldly pursuit of purpose, he could not find the eternal purpose that God desired to connect him to. Because in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he said what? It is set in the heart of all men, eternity. is set in the heart of all men. That he said to himself, I'm an eternal being. I'm created for more than just this life on earth. What I do matters, not just on this earth, but it has eternal consequence. So now he's bringing us to this point, and he says, listen, go read all the books you want to read, but I put everything right here for you. Why do you need to go waste your time when I'm giving you all the answers right here, right now? That's what he's saying. 
And he says, in fact, if you will read all of these Proverbs that I have written, he says they will act like a goad. You know what a goad is? A goad, we'll put it in our terms, not that I'm a farmer, all right? But I read about a goad, okay? Right? And so a goad is simply the ability to move cattle or move sheep to prod them what? Along in the direction that you want them to go, the right direction. And in fact, when you read about this and you study this, the way that they would goad specifically with cattle is that cattle, they like to graze. They're typically slow creatures. They like to be in one place and they get very, very, very comfortable in one place. But in order to get them to move to the place that they need to be so that they can be nourished and continue to grow, then they had to be goaded, right? They had to be moved along. And many of us are here in this room today and we are comfortable right where we are. We don't really want to be stretched. We don't want to go out of our routine. We don't want to do anything that's outside the normal. And so all we're doing is just existing in this life. But what the writer says is I want to goad you. I want to point you into a direction where you understand fearing God, living in obedience to him, understanding that you're going to be accountable to him, understanding that his purpose for your existence is more than just existing. We want to goad all of us today to the place that God has for us over here where we are rich and we are nourished. We want to be placed into a position to where we're experiencing all the promises that God has for our lives. But so many of us are just sitting over here going through the motion thinking that life has nothing for me, life has nothing to offer me, and that simply is not true. It's a lie. You have purpose, you have a plan, and God has a promise for your life. It comes down to your choice. When he says to us, now all has been heard, here's the conclusion of the matter, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. There's three things that you can be guaranteed of. In your life, number one, you're only going to find meaning and purpose when you place your faith in God. That's it. Go look everywhere else. Go read where you, wanna, where you want to read. But what he says is you are only going to find purpose and meaning when you choose faith in God. You're only going to live out purpose and meaning when you choose obedience to his purpose. So really sit for a moment and ask yourself the question, am I today in pursuit of God's purpose and plan for my life? Or am I operating according to the purpose and plan that I have outlined for my life? And if you're wondering why you're empty, it's most likely because you're doing the latter. You're choosing your plan and your purpose for your life. All of us need to be in pursuit. We need to be on the journey of what God has in store for our existence. It's far beyond what you can even imagine. God has more for you. You are limiting yourself. Why limit yourself when you have a limitless God? Why allow yourself to be harnessed when God wants to unleash you to do something in this world that is far beyond what you and I could ever, ever imagine for ourselves? Why do we choose to be limited? Because the enemy wants you to be limited. The enemy doesn't want you to see the gifting that you have, the plan that God has, the purpose that you have. The enemy doesn't want you to see it and he doesn't want you to know it. He wants to halt God's progress in your life. So one, do you have faith in God? If you have faith in God, I ask you secondly, are you in obedience to God? Are you choosing, yes, I've placed my, but are you choosing to walk according to that plan? Are you choosing to walk according to that purpose? Are you choosing to be intentional 
about the fulfillment of that plan and purpose that God has outlined for your life and for my life. You see, I can place my faith. I can know, God, You, yep, God, it's the plan and purpose. I know you're the source of it. But whether or not I choose to walk in it is completely different. So not only do I need to know God's plan for my life, I now need to choose to follow that plan. So he's saying, you will find fulfillment when you know the plan of God, but you will find fulfillment when you also obey the plan of God. And we don't like the word obedience in modern church today because it demands something of us, right? We want this idea, we're so non-committal about everything that, excuse me, please don't say the word obedience or that there's something that I need to do to honor God. No, we in our obedience are given the opportunity to fulfill God's plan for our life. And when that plan is fulfilled, God is honored, he is exalted, he is lifted up. We choose to be obedient. Some of us know what God wants We're not experiencing what God wants because we're choosing not to yield and submit to the plan that God has for our life. We're choosing to say no to what God has. And the only time that we choose to say yes to him is when we need a lifeline. Something happened bad. I'm in trouble. I got a need. And then suddenly we're on our knees, we're all searching and we're all wondering and we're all what, you know, we're doing everything that we can to find a way, 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 find a way. Listen, you're not gonna find a way until you choose to submit to the truth that he is the way, right? That's not gonna happen. Now, the third thing is this. I have faith, I have obedience, but I have accountability. What did he say there? He said what? If you look at that, he said, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is what? Good or evil. So there's gonna gonna be a moment where I'm gonna be accountable for my life. There's gonna be a moment where I have to answer for what I choose to do with my life. I have to be accountable. Do I believe that? You know, I would say that most of us don't because I think our lives would be a lot different. I think our churches would be a lot different. I think our faith would be a lot different if we really felt like accountability. And and accountability isn't because I'm fearful of God and he's gonna crush me, right? I'm not talking about living in faith and fear, but I'm talking about us understanding that God's purpose and plan, you're gonna give an answer for it. You got a job, right? When you do that job, typically when you come in on Monday morning, you've got a plan for the week. At the end of that week, you got a boss. And that boss at the end of the week says, how'd you do with your plan? Why does that boss say, how did you do with your plan, right? Because you've got a responsibility to be fulfilled and that accountability ensures that you do what you're supposed to do to achieve that plan throughout the week. It's no different here. God's got a plan. No one in this room is immune from God's plan. No one. God has it just for you. God has uniquely gifted you. And some of you, you're not even on the journey yet. You don't even know how God has gifted you, right? You need to start the journey to understand the gifting. But everybody in this room has a gifting. Everybody in this room has a purpose. Everybody in this room has a plan. And we will get a day of accountability where we will, before God, come to understand whether we followed that plan or whether we did not. And when you regret that moment, too late. It's too late. All will come to an understanding, the heart of the matter, faith, obedience, and accountability. But the key is when. The key is when. Young people, it's now. I stand before you unwillingly declaring that I am aged and mature. Unwillingly declaring. And these words that are spoken are true. Everything that we've read in Ecclesiastes is probably one of the most aligned books 
It doesn't matter what phase of life you're in, it aligns. And if you haven't been here the whole series, go back, watch it, and read it. But in each day, there are 24 hours. There are 1,440 minutes, 86,400 seconds, and every one of them is a precious gift from God. Every single one of them is a precious gift from God. One, do you believe that? Time is something we feel that we will never have enough of, yet we give it away so easily. Someone once said this, they said time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you can never, ever get it back. I've wasted time. Anybody else agree? If you realize how time is so precious, how does it change your conversation the rest of the day? Who you talk to? Where you spend your time? Someone also observed this. That a wasted life is really nothing more than a collection of wasted days. As God gives us life, each one of us starts the new year with the same number of opportunities, 365. And we can choose to either use or invest in eternal things or allow them to drift by with or allow them to drift by without taking advantage of the gift that we've been given. What will they say about you at the end of your life? The writer is coming to the end of his life, and that's why he's speaking to, he's like, listen, if you're young, reading this and in an earshot of what I've got to say, please listen to me. That's what he's saying. My days are coming to an end. Here's my story. What will they say at the end of your life? What will be observed by others when they talk about the way that you lived your life? This is a question for me that has a very powerful meaning. As most of you that are members of the church know that in September of 2022, I lost my wife, Angela. And I go every season, every season, I'm very good about it, my wife was quite the decorator. And she, my late wife, was quite the decorator. And so I choose to go to her crypt um, And I make sure that every season that I've got her crypt decorated properly. And so there's a picture here that they're going to show. They'll put that on the screen. This is Valentine's. Those flowers, the heart, all that put together. Angela loved candles, so I usually always have a candle. If you look at this, when I go there, and many of you know I've remarried, and Beverly, my wife, is also a widow. And she and I, she she goes with me and she helps me. And we were talking last night and this morning about the times that we go, and and we always kind of joke, but we're kind of serious about the fact that she says, David, not only is your name there, but you got a picture there. <laughs> That's a picture of me and Angela in the up, upper right-hand corner. But there's a difference here. Angela has a start and an end date. Her life started March 6, 1971. It, entered, it ended September 17, 2022. 
My start date was September 26, 1966. I don't have an end date. And when you go and you look at a nameplate on a crypt, when Beverly goes and she sees her name on a gravestone, we talked about this. It gives you a unique perspective on everything in between. Why? Because you have a reality that you're not guaranteed a moment. Each of us in this room, we will have an end date. For whatever reason, God chose Angela's end date, September 17, 2022, at 51 years of age. But yet, he has not granted me an end date. And I don't know when that end date will be. But you know what I do know? You know what I have learned? I think maybe for the first time in my life, at 57, I've learned that Ecclesiastes is quite a truthful book. That what matters in this life is every day that I choose to fulfill purpose, his purpose, in the moments that he's granted to me. I've chased the world, we all have. We've all had our moments where we thought it was the right job, the right relationship, the right group of friends, the right car, the right house, the right number in the bank account, We've all chased those things that said, well, that's going to give me fulfillment and purpose, but then you discover they don't. And what I can tell you in my journey, in my journey, that fulfillment and purpose and meaning is only found and discovered in relationship with God. And so I choose to have faith in his desire for my life. I choose to pursue what he wants to do with my being. I choose his purpose and his plan. Because in that, I find fulfillment. All that the world has for me leads me down paths where my days are wasted. And some of you are here today and your days are wasted. You've not placed your faith in God and you need to do that today. Some of you are here in this room today and you are a believer and you're living an indifferent life, and you're living apart from the will that God has for you. You don't have those gifts that he's granted you in motion and in action. Don't waste them. Why? Because guess what we get to do, church, together, when we collectively allow the days of purpose to be accumulated. We get to impact and influence a world so that they can understand that God has for them eternal life. They're not just beings that exist on this earth that have a start and an end date. They are creations of God that were created to live all of eternity and have impact and influence for all of eternity. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. And that's coming from an old man, and I'm trying not to let him in. But that's coming from experience and truth. So today as we close, that's my challenge to you. If you are empty, we've gone through this series, if you are empty, I'm giving you the place to start. <laughs> we have a prayer team that's forward and they will introduce you to the one we talked about at the very beginning. His name is Jesus. In him, I find the grace and the forgiveness and the love that I need so that I can connect to God the Father. And by connecting to God the Father, I can know his purpose. That prayer team will be forward. If you're here today and you're struggling because you feel like you are wasting day after day after day, let us pray over you. Let's get out of the rut. Let's move from, let's be prodded today. Let's be goaded today into the direction that God wants us to be in so that we are not just Christians by name, 
but we're Christians in reality because God, the living God, is seen and he is moving in our individual and collective lives. You don't have to live empty. Fulfillment can be found. Start that journey today. Let us pray. Father, we close in this moment, in this song. If there's anyone in this room that's empty and feels that life is wasted, Oh, God, I just pray that their hearts would be shattered today and that they would allow you to pick up the pieces and mold and shape them in a way to where you can fulfill what you have for their life and that they will yield to that, that they'll be obedient to that. But then, God, if there's those here today, they don't even know where to begin. They know they're empty, but they don't even know where to begin. Lord, let them take a step forward and allow us to lead them in this journey of faith that starts with the person of Christ. And God, for the church, let us put aside all the stuff that doesn't matter, all the time we waste on things that are irrelevant, and let us put our attention on purpose, fulfilling the mission and the vision that you have for us individually and collectively so that others can see and know the purpose and grace that you have for each of us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. You can respond if you need prayer, if you need to take a step forward in your faith, if you need to move beyond just in a place of indifference, just existing. Let's start that journey today. Churches, Pastor David said, there's not a moment to be wasted in this life, so we're not going to waste this moment as we leave today. Um, we're going to teach you guys a new song. It's called Bless God. No matter where you are right now, I pray that this song touches your heart. If you know it, sing it with us. If you don't, that's okay. Just stand there and worship Jesus. Come on. Bless God in the 
the fields of plenty, bless God in the darkest valley. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God when my hands are empty. Bless God with a praise that calls me. Bless God when nobody's watching. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God when the weapons for me. Bless God when the walls are full. be seated for just a few moments as we close today. Um, there are many ways that you can give to support the work that God is doing here at West Cobb Church. You can go to wccgive.com. You can download our app. There are drop boxes on the way out today if you get, want to give an offering, or you can mail a check to the church. We're so grateful uh, for your obedience and your faithfulness to our partners 
and the kindness and generosity of those that choose to give here. A few things that I want to highlight uh, that are uh, important. One, all of all the things we do here at the church are important, but these are kind of the ones that are kind of immediate, right? All right, so um, one, I'll get in trouble by, if, I, if I, that was not a good phrasing. Um, so, number one, uh, I want to celebrate our women's retreat. Um, they had, look at that, awesome time. Yes, and uh, just very grateful for the leadership uh, uh, among our ladies, and they just had a great time. They were there Friday and Saturday, and just looks like, uh, God, I know that God, speaking to several, God really spoke and moved there. And so, ladies, thank you for your commitment to finding and discovering God's purpose for your life. That's what that's about. Um, 